development means you must live from a worse off situation to a better situation. Heroes and heroines are ordinary people that do extraordinary things. I don't know who's going to win. They are waiting for their name to be called. In 2014, I was appointed as the speaker of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature. And I decided, I owe it to these women. Let me also do something for them. Welcome you to the Gauteng Legislature. That is the first annual Vita Basadi Awards. This year, those to 1,031 women were nominated in different categories. We start in the first week of July when we send out a communique to say it's now time to nominate a woman that you know and we advertise all those 10 categories. These are the people that have won. The achievement done by one woman is an achievement for all of us. Tonight is not is 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 present, but it's also about writing a history for the future. All right, and the winner for the Youth Dignitary Award is, drum roll, Litabo Monametsi. So the Youth Dignitary Award category is a category that is focused on primary school students or high school students who are example setters for their peer groups. I am a dancer. So I'm in South Africa. Currently, I'm the South African Youth Latin Champion. I'm also the South African Ballroom First Runner Up. I'm the South African Freestyle Champion. I'm also the South African Slow Dance Champion. The winner is Lungako Matinja. It's a Youth Philanthropist Award, which is actually about young people who are doing remarkable work that positive impact lives. I'm a patent founder of Miss um, Tertiary South Africa. It's a beauty pageant that advocates for education. We open entries to university and college students nationwide, and then we disperse scholarships to our winners. Uh, I believe in, you know, um, adding value in people's lives because there are many people that have groomed me, you know, and um, I, I actually want to give back as well. I am in awe. I am in disbelief. Like, this is the very first time I'm nominated for an award and actually won. So this is like a confirmation that I'm on the right path and I'm very grateful. And the winner is... Lebohang Munyati. I'm the founder of Miss South Africa, Wolchi. Also, I'm the first in Africa to model in the Wolchi. And I've represented South Africa in the field of Wolchi basketball. And the winner is... I'm a law student and my hobby is car spinning. So when I'm not at university, I'm spending with, chilling with my family. That's just basically my life. I was nominated for the Woman of Honor Award. It's about women in male dominated fields breaking boundaries. The winner is Patabili Toreke. In my community, I offer assistance to the youth. I assist them to start businesses instead of only looking at employment as an option. The category itself, it was for a community builder who is using her skills and resources to help others in the communities in, in the form of mentorship. Um, for, t for me tonight, the most important thing has been the intergenerational links. I'm sitting at a table in which there are women who were part of the 1956 Women's March. Just as Mom Sophia Dupree and even Mom and Dombi, she has gone through certain experiences and sacrifices in order for me to be here. Those women of 1956 started to level the playing field. That's why we are today. There are many gaps, yes, I agree, but there's a lot that has been done. But together, we can even still do more. The Lifetime Achievement Award for Mama May Phenomenal women. Women who are doing good things. Excellence to me is when you're trying to do your best. You know your limits. So when you reach your limit, you are excellent. We can't be perfect, but the little bit that one does every day, you become closer to excellence. Positively impacting lives. Accepting yourself with your imperfections and embracing your flaws and having the ability to lead by example. It's really hard to achieve your ultimate excellence if you haven't necessarily tapped into who you really are and what your heart needs. So excellence is breaking boundaries, leading others.
others and opening parts for others to walk. Inting in Holi Lenge participation is that in the case platform, you would to engage and also influence some of the decisions that are taken maybe by politicians or parliamentarians or whoever who would sit in a with Mshabi, but may never sleep. So it's important to have a register to vote because it so allows their person to vote who would have any say in whatever a political party does, whatever time they say, you would have to deliver once they are in power. If Uzo have your vote, Mele futhi wena as a young person who pinned the Upo, may evil digging as a low voice, they would complain among your phone complaint, would demand among your phone demand. Participate. When they show with a vote like Kola Kaus, because trust me, even the hashtag is being used everywhere. Evil Diako, a chance I call you to participate. I come out of Mos Purim Sangana, I'm 27 years of age. Today we have gathered the boys in the in the in Gauteng province from the five regions. And these boys were looking at them from the age of 14 up until 25. But now the main purpose is to groom them to become the real men where they will make sure that there is no gender-based violence. When we relaunched the, the structure, the GPL Men's Forum, we took a decision that it will not be a talk shop, you know. Uh, today and tomorrow, uh, we are moving towards that. Make sure that you are here to learn. But now, where does it start? It starts with you. I'm going to teach you this thing called fries. So F is for freely given. Consent is freely given as a choice. The R is consent is reversible. I can agree today, but tomorrow I can change my mind. Consent must be informed. If someone says to you, I want to have sex with a condom, and then you say yes, and then in the act you are suddenly saying, no, no, I don't want this thing, it's disturbing. Uh -uh. The E is for enthousi enthusiastic. A lot of people get in trouble because they simply don't read body language. To prevent you getting in trouble later, ask. And the last is be specific. Just because I say yes to kissing you doesn't mean I say yes to having sex. What we hope to achieve is to make sure that they develop as real men who really observe and respect other human beings. And we want to achieve the fact that they must really understand that gender-based violence, it's not really a good thing. This is real hiking. Today, at the mountain, how did you learn to get Because I don't know if I can learn to win. I give up a fail. Guys, what I want to tell you is a successful man is the one who is honest with himself. Don't choose bad things just because of you want to do a living. Doing things, remember, it's your choice. A real man is a man with respect and manners. That's the definition of handsome. And I'm saying when you leave here, when you leave here, go look at yourself in the mirror. Talk to yourself. Talk to the mirror and say to the mirror, this is me, I'm celebrating me, myself, and no one else. You're building confidence in yourself. You're becoming strong. The GPL makes laws for Gauteng province. New legislation starts out as a bill and must be relevant to the needs of the province. Once the bill is passed in Parliament, it becomes an act. The GPL oversee the Gauteng Provincial Government to ensure effective expenditure of the budget. GPL ensures that the work of departments and municipalities is integrated to ensure efficient service delivery. 
the GPL encouraged the citizens of Gauteng to participate in legislature activity. Public participation includes activities such as house sitting, public One, hearing, two. education workshops, sector parliaments, budget process, annual report, petitions, and the GPL heritage tour. Cooperative governance encourages cooperation between the three spheres of government, national, provincial, and local. GPL ensures that the work of departments and municipalities is integrated to ensure efficient service delivery to the public through intergovernmental relations. The GPL collaborates with different role players such as government departments, IEC, non-governmental organizations, non-profit organizations, and Chapter 9 institutions to try and make the lives of Gauteng citizens better. Due to COVID-19, the GPL brings you learning via our digital platforms. Stay home, stay safe, wear a mask to cover your nose and mouth, wash or sanitize your hands frequently, adhere to social distancing requirements, be a responsible citizen. I was expecting you in the gym. All right. No, no. Uh, with seven people, we have to accommodate this. So it's not. Yeah. Okay. No, I expected you as one of the leaders of the DA to be there. So.
No, thank you very much for thinking so highly. No, we will cover <laughs> the seven people, the right seven people. Which are the pinky? I, I complete pinky. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Uh, unmute yourself. Uh, you see, Mike has just put on the legislature background. Where's yours? I don't have it. Morning, colleagues. Morning. Hope everyone's well. Morning, morning. How are you, Asia? All good. All good. You're not, you're not wearing pajamas, so we want to see your face. No, I will, but my hair, Corinne, my hair, that I'm trying to fix first. Then I'm going to put on my, my camera. Thanks. Okay. All right. Hey. Likomanis. 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 MP, Sorena. Hey, yeah, <laughs> 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 Yeah. I got him chat. <laughs> no. it, it's good to be home. Yeah. yeah. Later. Yes, to ensure that our limited resources um, are not running around um, the the and the
Thank you very much. Can you all remain standing for a moment of silent prayer and meditation? Thank you. We may all be seated. Uh, good morning, colleagues, and good morning to all South Africans and the people of Gauteng. Good morning to our Honorable Premier, members of the Executive Council, leaders of political parties, members of the provincial legislature who are here in the sitting, but also who are joining us virtually but also to all South Africans and the Gauteng citizens. This is a special sitting convened in terms of Rule 14 of the Standing Rules, which reads as follows. At the first sitting of the legislature each year, the Premier must deliver an address on the state of the province. Furthermore, in terms of Rule 15, subsection 2, which reads as follows. This is a special sitting solely designated to receive the state of the province address delivered by the Premier. Rule 18, subsection 3 reads as follows. The only business that may be conducted at a special sitting will be the business for which it has been designated. Honourable members, can we please stand for the singing of the national anthem in terms of Rule 8, subsection 1, sub B, which reads as follows. The national anthem and the EU anthem must be performed at the beginning of the opening and closing of the legislature each year. Can I therefore request that all members must stand and join in the singing of the national anthem and the AU anthem.
Thank you very much. We may all be seated. I would like to welcome the following guests to the opening of the third session of the sixth legislature, starting with our Honorable Premier, members of the Executive Council, the Chief Whip of the Majority Party, leaders of political parties, members of the provincial legislatures, municipal speakers who are connecting virtually, uh, our diplomatic corps who are also connecting virtually, our acting judge, President Sutherland, who is here with us. I know that uh, he is attending on behalf of Honorable uh, Dim Lambo, who couldn't be here this morning. All judicial institutions, the, speakers, the Speaker of the National Assembly, the Chairperson of the NCOP, NCOP delegates, the SUBS Provincial Commissioner, Lef Lieutenant General Mawela, who is here with us, Dr. Ralph Mkijima, the Integrity Commissioner, who is here with us, all religious leaders, the SACP leadership, HODs from the Gauteng Provincial Government, the Pan-African Parliament, SALGA uh, uh, delegates, sports legends, CEOs of various corporate uh, companies, the AIDS Council in our province, ANC veterans and stalwarts, the COSATU leadership, ETOL panel members, the Turkish community leadership, ANC Youth League in our province, the Gauteng National Taxi, uh, Taxi Alliance, Nelson Mandela uh, Foundation, members of the Legislature Services Board, um, on behalf of the Auditor General of our country, uh, Ms. Sakane Malulega, who could not come physically, but she is connected virtually, the DG of the Office of the Premier, who is here with us, the Secretary of the Legislature and his guest, the Public Service Commissioner, Mr. Sluane, who is here with us, the guest of the Premier, former Premiers, guest of the Speaker, guest of the Deputy Speaker, guest of the Chairperson of, the, of Committees, guest of the Deputy Chair of Committees, the Sisulu family who are connected virtually, the GPL corporate sector, the Sanko PEC in Gauteng, executive mayors, the chapter nine and 10 institutions, speakers of the provincial legislatures in South Africa, former speakers of the Gauteng provincial legislature, secretaries of the provincial legislatures, the Ahmed Katrada Foundation trustees, the audit and risk committee members, the media, and all other guests and the people of Gauteng and the people of South Africa. If we have uh, other guests who have joined us uh, on, on other social platforms, we are also welcome. Thank you very much. Can we have the secretary reading uh, the first order? Thank you, speaker. The first order and the only order of the day is the State of the Province Address by the Honorable Premier. I now call on our Honorable Premier, Honorable uh, D.M. Makura, to address the House. Over to you, Premier. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, Honorable Ling Teng Ndombi Mehwe, our Deputy Speaker, Honorable Nomvuyo Mtlaga Azamanamela, the Chief Whip of the Governing Party, Honorable Mzigaifa Nekumalo, members of our Executive Council, presiding officers of the House, leaders of political parties represented in our legislature, Honorable members of this uh, august house, executive mayors and the speakers of our municipalities, the DG, heads of departments and CEOs of agencies of our provincial government, heads of chapter nine institutions, Lieutenant General Mawela, our provincial commissioner, compatriots, 
and fellow residents of Gauteng. On behalf of Team Gauteng, I am immensely grateful today to be given the opportunity by this House to deliver the 2021 State of the Province Address. Once again, I would like to say it is an honor to serve the people of our province. This beautiful province, it is an honor to do so, especially as we sail through the many storms that life has thrown our way. This year's State of the Province Address takes place at an extraordinary time in human history. These are profoundly difficult circumstances. These are different times when humanity is going through and is emerging from a storm of a deadly pandemic with risky existential proportions. In his book titled Kafka on the Shore, the Japanese writer Haruki Murakami opines as follows. I quote, once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what this storm is all about, close quote. The rapid outbreak and wide reach of COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted millions of people's lives, has disrupted institutions, and it has disrupted economies in a way never seen since the 1918-19 influenza pandemic and the 1929 Great Depression. The scientists and ecologists of our generation are warning us that pandemics and climate-induced natural disasters are likely to be a more frequent feature of our times, constantly causing major disruptions and further destruction of lives and livelihoods. In other words, we need to stop thinking that we will return to our new, our old ways of doing things. We have to build pandemic-proof as well as disaster-ready institutions and systems. And we have to embrace the new normal. Pandemics are not just about to pass. This pandemic may pass, but there may be more new pandemics coming our way. So honorable members, through this speech today, I would like to give feedback about what we have managed to do in 2020 and what we will do with regard to our priority work in 2021. But certainly, the number one priority is going to be the need to win the battle against COVID-19 and build resilient institutional and societal capacity to deal effectively with any future pandemics and disasters that will visit our province and our country. That is the first priority of this year. Second priority is for us to reignite the Gauteng economy so that our economy and our province can take a lead in South Africa's reconstruction and recovery. For we are the, the number one province, the economic hub of our country and the industrial hub of our continent. So we've got to lead in the economic reconstruction and recovery plan of our country and in the industrialization of our continent. Thirdly, we would like to recalibrate our social policy, to refocus our social policy on achieving educational outcomes and health outcomes, fighting crime and protecting the most vulnerable sections of our population especially against urban poverty and hunger. And lastly, that's the fourth priority, we would like to focus on improving governance ac across the Gauteng City region in order to deliver results to our residents and improve their quality of life. 
but to do so in a way that is governed by ethics, integrity, and accountability. So those are the four priorities, Madam Speaker, for us this year. Allow me to outline more comprehensively the work we have done in 2020 on each of these four priorities and what we will do in 2021 to push forward progress and achieve results in each of these four priorities. So starting with the battle to overcome COVID-19 in the Houghton City region, let us start by commending our president, President Cyril Matamera Ramaphosa, and our national government for leading the battle against COVID-19 very well over a protracted period of 11 months. This was a very, very difficult battle. It certainly has not been easy, and mistakes may have been committed in the process, but the determination to save lives and protect livelihoods is beyond question from our national cabinet and various sectors of our society. So we must thank you, Mr. President, and the national executive for leading our people and our country through this storm. We are at a moment now when we begin to see some glimmer of hope as we enter a new phase, the vaccination phase of the battle against COVID-19. Since March 2020, we have been through an emotional roller coaster as a people. We have been through pain, panic, anxiety, anger, and anguish. Many lives have been lost, and many livelihoods have been destroyed. In Gauteng province alone, over 400,000 people have contracted coronavirus, and most pain painfully, close to 10,000 people have succumbed to COVID-19. Half a million jobs have been lost, and 42% of small businesses were forced to close down with no prospect of ever reopening. Those who contracted coronavirus can attest that contrary to the views of denialists and conspiracy theorists, COVID-19 is no ordinary flu. It is a painful and deadly disease, and it does kill. Talking about the number of people who contracted coronavirus and subsequently those who died to COVID-19 is not just a statistical or epidemiological purpose. This is not just an exercise in academic pontification. This is a, to recount profound loss that our people have suffered. Many relatives, friends, colleagues, and fellow compatriots have died as we were sailing through this storm to try to get to safer shores. It is important to pause and talk about the pain inflicted by this pandemic if we are to heal the deep wounds and rekindle our wounded dreams of a better life, a better country, a better province, and a better world. Honorable members, acknowledging pain is not a signal of fatigue or is not to accept defeat. This is simply to underscore the human cost of this war, like all other wars. The war against COVID-19 has been costly on our people. As Murakami cautions us, those who have survived must not think that their lives will ever be the same. We will remain wounded, and we are wounded but not defeated. We must bounce back, and we shall bounce back as a province. We must be very grateful to the heroic healthcare workers who face this vicious virus and this ferocious pandemic with tremendous courage and resolve to save many lives. And many of us who fell victim to this pandemic were treated by these healthcare workers. And we are grateful to be alive, but sorry that so many people have to die, not only in our country, not only in our continent, but in the world. We commend thousands of essential workers 
such as police officers, security officers, public servants, members of the military, agricultural workers, energy workers, and retail workers who also continue to do work and kept our country going under difficult conditions of lockdown. All of them faced tremendous risks as they went about doing their, their work. And their work was simple, to continue to make sure that our people have access to their essential needs. Madam Speaker, please allow me to request members of our legislature to really pay honor. And I allow me to ask members of this legislature to rise to in honor of our healthcare workers, the healthcare workers of our province, of our country, and the world at large, to say thank you to them and give these healthcare workers a thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, honorable members. We salute our healthcare workers. We salute them for saving lives. We salute them for going all out there, for overcoming their own anxieties and fears, for going out there to go and work to face the enemy, this invisible enemy. We must make it clear that coronavirus is still around. And honorable members, we must also make it clear that the third wave is still a real possibility as we approach winter. However, we must say without any equivocation that vaccines constitute the decisive weapon against any pandemic. And the vaccination process and program and plan that is being rolled out has to be rolled out with a great deal of urgency to reach massive numbers of people so that we can ensure we hold this, the rage of this pandemic and save more lives and enable our economy to open and recover fully. We have come a very long way in building a response and in this particular case, a credible response and there's no time for complacency and cynicism. We need to put our country, our province, and the people above any petty professional rivalries and jealousies and any petty political squabbles. I would therefore like to share with you, honorable members, some of the objective conclusions arrived at in assessing the strengths and the weaknesses of the Gauteng response to COVID-19. I want to emphasize that these are some of the objective conclusions arrived at, not just by ourselves, but by several institutions to which I will refer later. What are some of those objective conclusions in assessing Gauteng's response to COVID-19? Firstly, our province established innovative, agile, and adaptive structures which ensured that there was a coordinated response to COVID-19 from national, provincial, and local government level. In particular, provincial and local government have worked together during this pandemic in a way never seen before, bringing us closer to the ideal of the governance model of our city region. The work of the provincial Coronavirus Command Council and its work streams in four, was informed by scientific advice with an emphasis on data-driven approach and evidence-based decision-making. As policy makers, we have come to understand the specific trajectory in our province that pa the pandemic has taken, and this held by our team of scientists, has enhanced our response, particularly in dealing with various hotspots at different times and in communicating with the people of our province about what is the next step and where is the danger coming. Coordination and collaboration with various sectors of our, our population in the province and in this particular case, I will thank particular sectors of our population 
This coordination was very critical in helping us, particularly during the peak of the first wave and as we approached the second wave. These sectors include trade unions, business organizations, the faith-based community, particularly the leaders, civil society organizations, and at a community level, using world-based war rooms, the leaders at a community level, street level leadership was also provided. And this helped us particularly during the time when we had many hotspots in our province, when the pandemic was raging, changing place to place, and attacking various sections of the population. We have worked together with these various sectors of our, our population, but we have also worked together as departments of the provincial government, agencies and municipal structures, as I said, in the way we have never seen before. We also dealt with teething problems together when we, we faced different problems, including the shortage of supply of PPE, and at the peak of the problem, also engaging with the religious sector about the impact of the pandemic on them, because many of them regard themselves also as counselors, uh, when people with the level of anxiety and uh, mental illness was rising, religious leaders were coming to us to say, we too want to be accredited to be able to talk to people in our communities because when things are tough, religious leaders in the communities also are a source of hope. So we tackled many, many difficulties, including the impact of various, various phases of, of lockdowns uh, on the various sectors of our population. And again, this also includes when we were to deal with the issue of the reopening of schools. Difficult questions had to be answered. We have also done something in the shortest space of time in 11 months that was unimaginable. We have expanded the capacity of our public health care system with 4,265 new functional beds and 4,992 posts were filled with staff between April 2020 in January 2021. If you think of these numbers, honorable members, it's like building several new hospitals at one go within a year. In addition to the 4,265 new functional beds that were added, we are in the process of operationalizing and making another 1,425 beds functional by adding staffing to these beds because to have beds, beds that are ready without staffing, even if the best technology is there, those beds would not serve any purpose. We will do so, add additional staffing as we commence the new financial year. As we said, the coronavirus pandemic is not over. The possibility of a third wave cannot be ruled out, even as we roll out vaccines, especially because the rollout of the vaccines has got different phases and may happen over time. In the meantime, we must continue the battle against COVID-19. So, honorable members, there should be no doubt that we have done significant long-term investment in improving the quality of infrastructure of some of our institutions and in expanding access to healthcare in areas previously in our province where it was difficult for people to have access to healthcare. healthcare. It is absolutely important that when all is said and done, that is understood that we would have invested for the next 20 years, particularly in critical care capacity that we have never had. And the clinicians have been giving us feedback. And one of the professors came to give us feedback and was, is, a, is a clinician, a critical care practitioner himself, a professor who is a, at Wirtz University and at uh, Charlotte Matlake University who said the investment we have made in critical care is something that will, for the next 20 years, that's, that's ICU beds, 
uh, and critical, other critical care fa facilities. We are saying the investment that we have made is something that will stand us in good stead as we face future pandemics which may arrive at any other time and other illnesses. That has to be understood. That, has, that investment has to be understood. And it takes me to the, to the other important issue about the pandemic, the dynamic of a pandemic in Gauteng province. And that is the, the, uh, the corruption allegations and actual irregularities and corrupt practices that took place in the in procurement processes, in this particular case about PPE, but the Auditor General and the Special Investigation Unit are also continuing to probe other areas. This is one story that undermined all the other things I've been referring to, all the other things about investing in critical care capacity and expanding our public health care system, improving the functioning of local government and provincial government in response to disasters. All these other issues around improving our capacity to use science and evidence and data to respond to real problems. All this story, which is the full story of Gauteng, is often it's often not told because the big, big, big issue, and it's understandable, it's a matter of great concern, has been the focus on irregularities and corrupt practices. And in this state of the province address, we're going to make it very, very clear what we are doing to ensure that we go back to the drawing board and address all the weaknesses that have been identified that led to a situation where a pandemic, a deadly pandemic, was seen as an opportunity to loot public resources. We, we will set an example that all those involved in corruption and malfeasance, both in the private and the public sector, will face the consequences of their own misdeeds and evil actions. We will set an example that where money was lost, the money's, money must be recovered and people must serve a jail term as those who were involved in wrongdoing. We will do so because this, this particular area has undermined great and tremendous progress we have made as a province in response to COVID-19. The Houghton City Region Observatory the United Nations Development Program, that is the UNDP, the Government Technical Advisory Committee of National Treasury, and the Department of Performance Monitoring and Evaluation at a national level have all been working with us. In addition to the National Department of Health, the National Department of COCTA, we have also been working with agencies that have been saying to us, giving us a a more objective and balanced assessment of what is coming out of the Gauteng COVID response. And an objective and balanced assessment of COVID, a COVID response by governments and by countries is absolutely necessary because when we understand how we have performed, when we understand the things that have worked and those that have not worked, we can deal with pandemics better. We can deal with disasters much more effectively than we have done before. We can draw lessons about strengthening cooperative governance. We can deploy evidence and data much more effectively in making decisions. And we can build social compacts and partnerships with various sectors of society. Partnerships that last beyond solving one problem. Partnerships that will stand us in in good stead when we tackle other pandemics like GBV, gender-based violence and, and femicide, when we tackle the fundamental problem of an economy that excludes the majority of our people, when we deal with poverty and hunger. It is absolutely important that we draw proper lessons from what, what worked during this pandemic, including in helping us to offer appropriate responses to the next set of uh, priorities, the three priorities. Honorable members, one of the lessons we have learned is that without social mobilization and society-wide support, it will be difficult to win the battle against any pandemic. 
Security forces and law enforcement agencies have their role, but they, they alone cannot enforce regulations. They cannot enforce health protocols. They cannot force people to comply. So we've got to invest with mobilizing people to understand they are, they are self-conscious agents of change, and they must take steps to protect themselves and those uh, they live with in communities. It is an important lesson that we are carrying forward about the mobilization of communities. Because in this province, when we were successful in, a, in getting the message to our communities to avoid crowded places, to avoid closed spaces, to avoid close contacts, to wear, uh, to wear their masks, uh, to sanitize and wash their hands, when we got those messages at critical moments, it really, really worked for us. But we also know when people lowered the guard, like in the run-up to, to the festive season. We saw people lowering the guard. People were a bit fatigued about these measures. And people started to feel like we are in another world, in another era. When that happened, when young people started to party, when family members started to gather, the pandemic returned, and it was now a new variant that came with the ferociousness that has not seen before. But we can trust people, and we must communicate with people and give them information. That's one important thing that we have. When we give people information, not scare them, but give them information, they can act in their best interest uh, to protect themselves and those of their, their loved ones. We are grateful to the members of the Advisory Committee on COVID-19 of our province for providing data and timelessly tracking the dynamics of the pandemic in different parts of our province. And this underpinned our science-driven and evidence-based approach in this battle. We are very proud of the Houghton-based universities and academic hospitals because they, are, they have top-class, world-class researchers. They have world-class clinicians who have been at the cutting edge of giving leadership in the outbreak of this uh, pandemic. And many of them led, break, they, they led groundbreaking initiatives about getting more knowledge about what this novel coronavirus is and how to treat COVID-19 in the various uh, uh, hospitals and in the, in the, in the wards. So, honorable members, our country's response has demonstrated that we as a country has enormous scientific and industrial capabilities that we often forget about. Again, I want to take this opportunity to salute our universities for the work that they have been doing, and not just here in Gauteng province, in KwaZulu-Natal, in, in the Western Cape. They have been leading as top class and world-class researchers in helping us to understand the most effective response to this deadly pandemic. Last week, we entered a, a more positive and promising frontier in the battle against COVID. And this is as a result of beginning a process of vaccinating 67% of the population of our province. We indeed intend to vaccinate 10.4 million people in Gauteng province. This is what our plan is. It was a plan. It is still a plan. And we call on people of our province to get ready to vaccinate in large numbers. Vaccines do save life, honorable members. We must dismiss all these conspiracy theories and fake news. Vaccines do save lives. We have to get as quickly as possible, as many vaccine doses as possible to ensure that, particularly as we approach winter, to ensure that the risky sections of the populations, the elderly, those with comorbidities, are, are, after we are done with the healthcare workers, that those are going to be the critical area of concern for us. It is absolutely important, honorable members, that we understand the phase that we are in now. 
Currently, there, there is an administration of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as part of this, starting as part of research to, imp to implement research that's linked to a much better understanding of the impact of these various vaccines that are available. We're hoping that with this very first phase of this program, more healthcare workers will be protected and we can see more healthcare workers are taking vaccines across our province. We have received 16,800 doses for the vaccination of healthcare workers in the next two weeks as part of this phase of the research program. Steve Biko Academic Hospital received 5,720 doses, and Chris Hani Baraguana Academic Hospital received 11,080 doses. So far, honorable members, over 5,000 members, the health healthcare workers, by, by yesterday, by last night, over 5,000 healthcare workers in Gauteng had taken the vaccine. In other words, they had been vaccinated. Uh, by last night, over 5,000 healthcare workers. As more vaccine doses arrive, we want to reach 215,000 healthcare workers as part of phase one. That's the number of both public and private healthcare workers in Gauteng. You can understand that 215,000 is quite a lot. We still have a very long way to go, but there's a glimmer of hope. When we will get to phase three, that phase two that focuses on essential workers, and in that phase two, we are going to be focusing on the vaccination of 7.3 million people. And I've already explained what the target population is. It's essential workers. That includes the teachers and the police. Uh, also, uh, other workers as well as the risky, those who are at great risk. Uh, people, the elderly people and people with comorbidities. We will then get to phase three of the vaccination program, which will focus on the rest of the population uh, over 18 years or, or, old, about 2.7 million uh, people. Honorable members, I want to say to you, you, you and I must wait for our turn. We must stand on the queue. We must wait for our turn we must stand on the queue. The president has already taken the vaccine to send a strong message to the, our people uh, and the rest of us, except those who are healthcare workers like uh, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, uh, who, uh, the MEC for Health, who took the vaccine. She is a healthcare worker. All of us must wait for our turn, and we shouldn't try uh, to jump the queue because. I think there are many people on the queue who are ready and fit to take the vaccine, like myself. They are warming up on the queue. Many of us are warming up on the queue. We want to take the vaccine. And that's why there should be no delay. There should be no delay. And, and, and understandably, we should be impatient with the wait. We want vaccines to arrive as of yesterday. We in Gauteng have chosen to work with national government, local government, universities, trade unions, civil society, and the private sector in responding to all dimensions of this, this pandemic. We have chosen this approach because pandemics in, and natural disasters require humanity to respond with solidarity. They require partnerships. Federalism or vaccine nationalism will not work. A vaccine can't just work for one country. If there are other many countries around you that don't have access to the vaccine, even if you have the strongest army and you build a wall they, to make sure they don't come, vaccines don't work like that. And pandemics don't work like that. Viruses and pathogens don't work like that. So we need in, and this international cooperation approach international solidarity. The, the countries that have more resources cannot think that they'll stop pandemics by hoarding all these vaccines to themselves. As long as we, the others are not safe and the others don't have access to vaccines, you are at great risk yourself. So the rich and the more wealthy countries better know that if we are to defeat this pandemic, 
all of humanity must be our focus of attention. So all this vaccine nationalism, and as I say, even an element, an inclination of some federalism, and think that one province can make it and protect people in its province and leave out the others, that does not work. The whole country must work, but not just South Africa, the continent. And that's why our president has invested hugely in, in leading Africa's response, because even if we were to get vaccines for all South Africans, for this pandemic, we are not safe if there are problems in our neighborhood. And that's very, very fundamental to understand that type, that part of human history, solidarity is fundamental to solving humanity's problems. Honorable members, I would like now to deal with the question of the economy. Our province is taking a lead in reigniting reconstruction and recovery, not just of our provincial economy, but the South African economy. We are doing so under difficult conditions of COVID-19. We had to adjust and adapt our plan of action, GGT 2030, growing Houghton together. We had to adapt it since we launched it in February 2020. We had to adapt it because conditions have changed completely. I would like to emphasize that GGT 2020, 2030 remains our, our plan of action not just for the provincial government, but for the entire Houghton city region. We in this province and in this city region have a common vision and a common plan of action for the immediate and long-term development of every corridor and every district of our province. We have one common plan. This has been reaffirmed, and this is heartwarming for me. It has been reaffirmed by all municipalities in our province, regardless of who is in charge of which municipality, regardless of whichever party is running. We have a common plan, and that plan is growing out and together. We have a common plan for the north, which is the city of Tswani, for the south, which is the, the city bank district, for the east, which is the city of Ekurulen, for the west, which is the western district, and for the for the central corridor of our province, which is the city of Johannesburg. There's one plan for every district, for every metro, and one plan for our province. All of us are directing our energies to the implementation of this plan. And as I say, this plan must survive and will survive the difficult times ahead, including when there are changes in government. We are going to local government elections. We need planning, the type of planning as a country and as a system of government that survives changes in government. Because if you do a new plan every five years, you have no long-term plan for a locality, you have no long-term plan for a community, you have no long-term plan for a region, you will always be starting afresh. And, and you will not be able to achieve long-term sustainable development goals. So the Houghton City region, as I said, is taking a lead in the implementation of the plan announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa. We are focusing on our own high growth priority sectors. We are deploying infrastructure investment and rolling out infrastructure projects to unlock the transformation, modernization, and reindustrialization of the different districts and corridors of our province. Once more, we have identified what the key sectors unique to Gauteng are. This is not just another economy. We are not competing in what type of economy we are with other regions. Other regions and other provinces have got their own comparative advantage. We are focusing on the following sectors. The automotive, aerospace, and defense is a critical cluster for us in our province because of the nature of our province. Transport and logistics sector is another critical part of our economy. The ICT and digital services are critical because we are the headquarters of global ICT companies. The energy sector, particularly diversifying our economy, our, our energy mix is another critical sector. Tourism and hospitality, and again, we are not competing with those who have... Who have uh, a table mountain or who have a, a, 
Ushaka. We are not competing with coastal provinces. Uh, the type of tourism and hospitality in our province is very unique. We have a very competitive food, beverages, agro-processing and agribusiness sector, extremely competitive in the context of our continent and in the context of the Africa continental free trade area. Construction and infrastructure is absolutely critical. It's a sector, as I will explain, demonstrate later. Infrastructure does create jobs with immediate effect. Some of the jobs may be short term, but those jobs are very critical to helping people to put bread on the table. Then we've got the financial services sector, because Johannesburg is the financial nerve center of the whole continent. We cannot abandon the financial services se sector. We have to work with this sector to leverage new technologies to ensure that financial services are and resources are deployed to enhance the productivity of other sectors of our economy and to improve the quality of life of more citizens. We've got a very dynamic cultural and creative sector in Gauteng. Young people born in the rural areas, born in different parts of our country, come here to realize their dreams in the creative sector of our economy. We have very competitive create sporting infrastructure in our province to produce some of the best and most competitive sports persons uh, globally. And lastly, we, the new sector of the economy, cannabis, the cannabis industry. We want to be the industrial hub. We already have industrial infrastructure. So industrial, pro, the processing of cannabis, not to smoke, please. Not to smoke, I know some are already imagining it. The processing of cannabis, particularly cannabis as a, for health purposes and for other parts of improving the quality of life of humanity. And many of you would not know, Honorable Makashuli, many of you would not know, I've listened to many people who say that cannabis cures, has got antiviral and uh, properties that cures many other diseases. I don't know myself, and not for smoking, but when it is processed, it has got many other important uh, 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 properties that help. So we are positioning Kauten Pro not so much to grow it, but to process it, because we already it may be grown in the Eastern Cape. The Eastern Cape says it wants to be the heartland of growing cannabis. We want to process it as an industrial heartland of our province. So in doing all that, in intervening in all these sectors, we are enhancing the industrial capabilities of our, our, our city region because we have adopted a posture that we don't only want to re-industrialize Houghton province, but we want to be the engine of Africa's industrialization. It is for this reason, honorable members, and often the, when we talk about special economic zones, it, it's for this reason that honorable members and the people of our province must understand the critical role played by these special economic zones. Because the special economic zones are going to be hubs of producing goods and services modern goods and services of the highest quality using advanced industry 4.0 technologies for, for exporting these, firstly for using them in the domestic market, but principally for export, and exporting them particularly in our, into our continent, into the different parts of our continent as part of the Africa continental free trade area. So this special economic zones, today I want to give you a piece of good news about progress on special economic zones. Having spoken about the pain and the anguish inflicted upon the people of our country and the world by COVID-19 and the jobs that were lost, we have some piece of good news today. Firstly, progress is being made at the Tswani Automotive Special Economic Zone, TASES, and that progress is extremely inspiring. And I want to share with you that progress today. The three spheres of government, the Gauteng Provincial Government, the City of Tswani, and the Department of Trade, Industry, 
and competition are working together in a way that has not been achieved on many projects before. Together as the three spheres of government, we, have, we are investing 3.3 billion rands in, in infrastructure, both bulk and the top structures of the special economic zone. And someone may say 3.3 billion rand is a lot from government. Special economic zones are about building industrial infrastructure that will make you competitive. And out of this initiative of provincial and local as well as national government, we have been able to, to unlock two sets of investment. Firstly, 4.3 billion rent by the suppliers. These are smaller, smaller businesses small and medium-sized businesses that produce parts that are going to locate in the special economic zone. So the supplier companies have come to party. They are investing 4.3 billion rands. But most importantly, Ford Motor Company has just announced on the 8th of February an investment of 15.8 billion rands. That's a full $1 billion investment. One billion dollars investment in an era of COVID-19, in a period where economies in the world are struggling with, with attracting investment. So, honorable members, let's add the sums together. So, 4.3 billion rands, 15.8 billion rands, 3.3 billion rands. How much is that? That this is an investment that is happening in our lifetime in the special economic zone in Swan. This is the biggest foreign direct investment we have ever had since the, the 2010 World Cup. There's no single investment that has gone into any specific area in any part of our country at one go that, that, that can beat this investment. And out of this autom Swani Automotive Special Economic Zone, 200,000 vehicles are going to be produced. 200,000 vehicles will be produced by 2022. It's not far. By June 2022, the special this Automotive Special Economic Zone will be producing 200 thousand vehicles. This excludes, this is just for Ford, it excludes what hap what's happening in Roslyn with regard to BMW and Nissan there. And the investment figures exclude what investment was announced by our president uh, for those projects. But there are, there are more exciting news about the Tswani's automotive special economic zone. The Mamelodi community the entrepreneurs and small businesses in the township have been working with the, with the company that is established because a special economic zone must be run by a, a company itself. They've been working with this to, to offer financial and non-financial support to 262 small, medium enterprises in the community, in the locality. This is a new approach to how you unlock investment. Big or small, domestic or global, every investment must empower local communities. And here, we talk about true small businesses. Mr. Mutara, we're not talking about the guys who disrupt projects there who just want money even before they work. These are proper businesses, 262 SMMEs of grade one to seven. And this SMME so far have already benefited 1.7 billion rands of the infrastructure side of this investment. In other words, as you build the bulk as well as the top structures. So they have already 47% of, of the infrastructure invest spent is already on the SMMEs. This is unheard of. We haven't heard that. We get, we're, getting, we're getting close to 50% in no time to empower township businesses of all sorts, including those who are in the sector uh, itself, to be primary beneficiaries of investment. As if that is not enough, within the next 12 months, between now, February 2021, and 
February 2022, Ford Motor Company is going to employ 1,200 new employees. These are permanent jobs. And the suppliers, these companies that are going to be supplying parts that are locating in the SEZ, will add another 2,088 jobs, permanent jobs. So in total, in the next 12 months, in total, 3,288 jobs are going to be created in the Tswani Special Economic Zone alone. These are permanent jobs. In the midst of COVID-19, when jobs are being lost, one specific project that tells a story of how government can work together with business, with communities, uh, to ensure that we can attract investment is working. In addition to these permanent jobs, 8,600 construction-related jobs are be, will be created. You know construction jobs, most of them are not permanent. So people come and build something. When they are done, they move to go somewhere else. That's the nature of the infrastructure sector. So 8,600 construction-related jobs are also going to be created in the run-up to opening this SEZ to be fully functional in 2022. So what have we learned from the Tswani Automotive Special Economic Zone, which must also work for all the others? This is a prime example, firstly, of spatial and economic transformation and integration of people and communities and businesses that have often been on the periphery of our economy. Their integration into the mainstream of the economy, including their integration into the value chains and supply chain of global businesses. This is the first, the first example. The second exam, ex good example about this, about how to bring black-owned black companies, women-owned businesses, township businesses, into a mega project so that they too play a role, especially those in the locality there. In addition, this SEZ is also a perfect model of a social compact between different spheres of government and different sectors of society. We have had to work so hard with Ford Motor Company. This investment could have gone to Asia. There is a country in Asia that was doing everything to get this investment. Those of you who don't know, Ford has moved out of Brazil, pulled out four billion rents out of Brazil to decide where to spend, reinvest that because where they were located, things were not working. This, and I don't want to demotivate. I don't want to go there uh, in detail. But we are one of those those jurisdictions that they decided we will take $1 billion out of the $4 billion, we'll take that $1 billion to South Africa. It's a powerful statement of, of confidence on our country and confidence that government can move with speed and make decisions and solve problems and attract investment and cut red tape and function properly and create conditions for for private sector people to come and invest and create jobs in our economy, and in the process also empower our people. So, honorable members, this, this is a model we want to use elsewhere. I want to say that as we look beyond the Tswani Special Economic Zone, the Automotive Special Economic Zone, we are, the, the momentum of this Special Economic Zone has created impetus for other projects. The president has also announced the Gauteng Eastern Cape freight rail corridor because it was catalyzed by this big investment. If you are producing goods and services in Gauteng, you need to move these goods and services to the ports. We can't only move them to, to one port of our country, we must have the routes to the ports opened and this has helped us also to catalyze a very important project that is the Tambo Springs Logistics Hub. So by getting one thing to work, one pro investment project, mega project to work, we have helped to give momentum to other projects as well uh, to ensure that uh, there can be public confidence, including state-owned enterprises can begin to see that 
we must work with great speed to unlock opportunities uh, and move the goods produced in this economic hub to the different parts of our country, to the ports, so they can be moved uh, into our continent and to the world. I want to give progress report also on the Sidibeng district intervention. Our intervention there on Sidibeng district announced as part of Growing Cauten Together, which you, you know very well is about the Val River City Special Economic Zone. We are now working with the DBSA, with the DTIC, with the Sidibeng district municipality on finalizing the following. We are finalizing the feasibility study, the master plan, and the regional spatial development fr framework, which will be helpful to, in the creation of this special economic zone. By the end of this year, we are confident that this, the Val River City Special Economic Zone will be approved by the Board of, of Special Economic Zones in the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition. We now have a way of getting approvals much, much faster. That's how we got the Tswani uh, SEZ to be approved. Within six months, it was approved once we finalized the plans. So the Val Special Economic Zone will be approved by the end of this year. The DBSA has set aside one billion rands to help us do the following. You know the district municipalities do not have bulk infrastructure funding. They don't get bulk infrastructure funding, unlike the metros. So the, the DBSA, that's the Development Bank of Southern Africa, has set aside one billion rands to help us to upgrade infrastructure in, the, in Sidibeng, particularly big bulk infrastructure, especially in the areas where the Val River City Special Economic Zone is going to be located. And help us address existing infra infrastructure problems. Some of the existing infrastructure pro problems includes issues around the roads and the, and the sewer uh, problems in the Val. I'm also happy to report that we are making progress on the West Rand Special Agro Processing Zone. In other words, a special economic zone that will focus principally on agriculture and agro-processing. We are working with Sibanye Steel Water, together with the district municipality of the West Rand. Again, we have drawn in the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition, supported by Basmark, the West Rand Mega Park Project, and a small-scale farmers under Bukamuso Baruna. We are working with them to ensure that by the, again, by the end of this year, we want the, the, the Western Special Economic Zone to be approved. So the, the DBSA and the African Development Bank, as well as Sibanye, Sibanye Steel Water, are helping us in the finalization of the, the, the master plan of this Special Economic Zone. So what is our story, honorable members? Progress, the things we said will happen during the term of this administration. Even in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of COVID-19 COVID pandemic, we have been working hard. We have found new ways of working to get these things to be attended to. I also want to report about the eastern corridor of our province, the city of Ekuruleni, which is the manufacturing and aviation hub of our country. In the last 12 months, there's some significant progress regarding the development by AXA. That's OR Tambo International Airport developments around there. Uh, the, 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 the midfield cargo terminal, that's the construction of the cargo terminal, which is going to be a game changer for cargo uh, in, in, uh, in, in our aerotropolis and in our province, the transportation of cargo in our, in our, in, 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 at OR Tambo as a regional aviation hub. This midfield cargo terminal is a game changer. There's also real progress with the development of the Western Commercial Precinct. When you go to OR, OR Tambo, you can see these developments are underway. These are critical because it is at OR Tambo that we have another special economic zone in Gauteng, which we launched in March 2019, 
which is called the OR Tambo International Airport Industrial Development Zone, IDZ. IDZ is another form of an SEZ. That IDZ attracted 1.5 billion rands of investment. It is currently focusing, it is focused on agro-processing, but we know that our vision of that IDZ is to also ensure that we're going to have jewelry manufacturing there. But we also want to attract in there electronic manufacturers and other manufacturers of, uh, of goods in that, uh, in that IDZ. So it is absolutely important that progress is made in Ekuruleni. Those of you who have not visited the project of building trains, the Gibela project, trains proper, proper state of the art trains are being built in Ekuruleni in South Africa. Proper ones, not the ones that, uh, that came, from, those ones came from Spain. The, the proper, proper trains are being built. I would like to urge I would like to urge uh, the Portfolio Committee of, on uh, both Transport and Economic Development to visit. The work being done there is amazing, done by South, young people trained, the best artisan South African young people trained all over the world about artisan work. They are involved there, state-of-the-art trains are being built right here uh, in our province in Ekurulen. So the last, the last area of, of regional and economic uh, uh, corridor development is the city of Johannesburg. The city of Johannesburg contributes 45% to our provincial economy. They don't need to be taken care of. They can look after themselves. What has happened in the last 12 months, which is good, I want to report it, is that many projects that have got stuck in the city of Johannesburg, for the developments in the north and developments in the south, those projects are now, they are now, they are, they, the city has come to party, including on issues of bulk infrastructure, but also development approvals. Because we had said to the leadership of the city, from 2016 we have projects that could not move because of politicking. We cannot move this province when you just have politicking, this coalition and that coalition, this one doesn't work, and this one must go, and that one must do that, and the economic projects are not moving because of politicking. At the moment, I'm happy to report that these projects are back on track. After five frustrating years, I must tell you, I was very frustrated from 2016. Five frustrating years when May, mega projects about developments in the city of Johannesburg, the northern areas uh, of the city of Johannesburg and the southern areas of the city of Johannesburg. So the leadership of the city needs to understand, including the new leadership that may come out of local government elections. We can't stop projects because they are new leaders. Uh, elect, they want to stop economic development uh, for another three, four years, because they want to find their, their way through. That cannot work. A governance system that works like that will kill development completely. President Ramaphosa has also announced in the State of the Nation address that Lanseria City Master Plan has been signed off by all stakeholders. There are people here who think this thing of Lanseria is a pipe dream. It will never happen. Uh, there are people here who think it will never happen. But I want to say that, again, working with provincial government, working with the four municipalities in our province, plus the municipality in the northwest, working with the DBSA and national government, are uh, unlocking the bulk infrastructure. You cannot have any development in an area if there's no investment in bulk. So the Lanseria city will, will happen as these other projects are, 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 are happening in our province. I want to, to thank all the spheres of government that has worked with us to unlock opportunities and investment in our province because we want to be a province that attracts investment. We want to be a province that grows, that is a preferred destination for domestic and foreign direct investment. And we want to deal with issues of uh, the ease, improving the ease of doing business in our province, cutting red tape and providing the necessary bulk infrastructure in development nodes that we are unlocking. We want to also approve all development applications as quickly as we can. So, honorable members, 
It is important as we do all these other things that we also focus on the new economy, the digital economy. I am very happy that the, our work on the fourth industrial revolution led by a panel and the work being done by e-government e in our province is producing results. We are improving the functioning of government, the deployment of new applications to improve access to e-services or public services through electronic platforms is something that we are achieving at a very great uh, speed. We are also rolling out uh, broadband to schools, more schools, uh, to our hospitals, to our clinics, to our libraries, and various government offices in our province. Uh, we, we want to make sure that particularly in the townships there are hot Wi-Fi hotspots so where young people in particular and community members can have access to internet because that's what helps, will help them to realize their dreams, including those who are entrepreneurs who want to build their own businesses. So access, access, access to government services, public services online is something that the pandemic has forced us to improve on. We are working with the Simulohon Center, the Gauteng Innovation Hub, to also improve digital skills amongst the different sections of our population, in particularly amongst the youth. We have a program that was piloted, which is called Hashtag Digital Sisters, which is an intervention focusing on females to introduce, to introduce women to the digital economy and ensure that they, amongst women, they participate actively in in artificial intelligence, big data, and internet of things businesses. We are also working with various partners, including the public-private growth initiative, and ICT and BPO companies to make sure that Gauteng province continues to be the best location for global business services. And honorable members, in a short space of time, the BPO sector has grown by 30% because of the work we've been doing over three years with various sectors of our, of our economy in this province. So, at this point, I want to deal with the issue of infrastructure. So how are we deploying infrastructure to unlock critical investment? I've already made reference to the issue of bulk infrastructure, but infrastructure development is critical. One of the critical areas of focus on that is building proper, upgrading our roads, expanding our roads, rehabilitating our roads, and building a new road network. So we have identified 18 arterial roads that will, will, will be the integrators of our, our province in moving goods and services and people from the different parts of our province. But there have been delays in our roads infrastructure development. There have been significant delays uh, in that. And some of these delays are completely inexcusable. Others may have to do with, like other infrastructure projects, may have to do with, with uh, COVID-19 regulations, but others have to do with the bureaucracy and incompetence, uh, MEC Mamamul. I'm glad that the department has now set up capacity, proper capacity, so that the, this road development program and upgrading of roads and building of roads as a way to catalyze development happen as fast as we want to. We are pleased to report that the construction of phase two of the N14 has been completed as well as the R28 which connects the West Rand and City Bay. There's more work happening now given the rains on rehabilitating and resurfacing a lot of roads across the different parts of our province. So road, road infrastructure development is critical as part of our public transport system. I want to report that we are con going ahead with the expansion of the Gau train. Expansion of the Gau train to areas previously not covered by the Gau train in the eastern part of Tswani, in the western part of our province, and in the southern part of our province. We are going ahead with expanding the footprint of the Gau train but we have discontinued adding additional coaches because demand is lower now out of COVID. The demand for the Gau train has gone down. So we don't have to add additional coaches 
that the, which was the plan, but we are, we are expanding the how train infrastructure will be expanded to the different parts of our province. I also want to report that we have now established the, trans the Houghton Transport Authority, which is paying attention to integrating our public transport system. I am confident that we will have this year, by the end of this year, MEC Mamabulo, a single ticket that can be used for different transport modes in Houghton. One of the res immediate results of the Houghton Transport Authority is to ensure that you can use one ticket to move into bus services, to move into the train services in our province. We are also working with the taxi industry, which is a critical sector that moves more than 60% of the commuters in our province. And I want to report to this legislature that we've, the Commission of Inquiry into, into Taxi Violence has just completed its work and reported publicly. And I want to thank members of the commission, which was chaired by Justice Jeremiah Shongwe, uh, which did a great work in getting us to understand the profound underlying causes of the violence and the fact that the business model of this, sec this sector needs to change. The business model of the taxi industry need needs to change. And that we need to help empower the industry to play a role in our integrated modern public transport system. So MEC Mamabulo got clear instructions from our executive council to implement the, the recommendations of the Commission of Inquiry. We are also focusing on building a new post-apartheid urbanism and sustainable urban settlements as part of the urban agenda in our province. Spatial injustice must be reversed and confronted with a radical counter-narrative of inclusive, sustainable, and transformative urbanism. In achieving this, the first thing is land use settlements. We are using land use, land use policies and frameworks to transform the space and integrate the various areas of our province. Linked to it is the land release program, which we will report about in a minute now. So honorable members, Human settlements are critical in making of, of our, uh, counting the best place for people to locate, work, uh, and live in our province. Since the start of the sixth administration in May, we have completed 18,000 units and 14,000 sites who have, which have been completed for residents in our province. We have also completed 13,000 title deeds, and formalized 52 townships. We are on track with regard to the, the revival of urban renewal projects in our province, which we have identified there are four. And we, we have identified 9,000 sites that are going to be handed as part of the land release program. These sites will be handed there was a delay with the handing over of these sites as part of our land release. You couldn't do it with the COVID regulations. You couldn't get people to gather together and do some of the things. But this program will take place from April this year uh, as, as, as one of the critical focal points of the sixth administration. We are continuing to make progress on the formalization of informal settlements and the upgrading of hostels across our province is a matter that we have been focusing on. And I know that on that issue, we have not made as much progress as we would want, but this is an important area of focus for our administration. So honorable members, one thing that's really concerning for us is the increase in land invasions, especially in the south of Johannesburg. Land invasions, have become a sore, a sore site in our province. We are working with municipalities and law enforcement agencies to stop law, land invasions, but this is not easy, especially in a period where some of our municipalities were not responsive, uh, almost like politically sponsored land invasion processes, where people were being watched invading land and putting up structures uh, everywhere, in the, especially in Johannesburg.
in the south of Johannesburg. This is a critical issue that we are, we are, we are, we are working with municipalities on. So it is absolutely important that we also create a, new, a regulatory framework and financial instruments that support the growth of the township economy. I want to say today, Madam Speaker, that this legislature, this year, this legislature must pass the Township Economic Development Act. This year, this legislature must pass the Township Economic Development Act. We have completed consultations. <laughs> Government has completed com consultations on the draft bill. We are bringing this bill in April into this house because we want, this is a game changer. The Township Economic Development Bill and when it becomes the act is going to create a new environment. Firstly, it will nullify all the bylaws that criminalize small businesses uh, in our townships. Those bylaws are going to be nullified. It will create a new regulatory framework to support the, create, the growth and striving of small businesses in the townships. Secondly, we are setting up the Township Economic, the township economy Partnership Fund, which is part of the, that bill. And MEC Tau and MEC Nkomorali Hoko are going to make detailed announcement on how much will go into the township economy the township economy fund. People in the townships cannot have access to formal banks to support their own businesses. So the township economy fund is going to support township startup businesses and small businesses to grow in a way never seen before. So we have it, our economy has lost 660,000 jobs during, the, during the, the second quarter. But I have good news for you. Even though we lost that number of jobs, this provincial government, working with municipalities, has used infrastructure projects, youth development programs, environmental programs, and social development programs to create jobs whose total, the total number of jobs is 130,000 jobs created by government initiatives. Some of them are short-term jobs, others are long-term jobs. In social development projects, in infrastructure projects, as I said earlier on, in some of, the, some of the youth and women empowerment initiatives. I'm not going to take you through the breakdown of these numbers. It's, you will have time to go through it. In the period when it has been so difficult for the economy to function, this government has been intervening to ensure people can put bread on the table. I therefore now want to deal with an important area of our program. How do we use social policy to enhance educational outcomes, fight crime, and attack poverty and hunger? This government, this ANC-led government, has done something quite significant in the course of this year. And one of those significant things we have achieved is the intervention to, to be able to, to, to reach 3 million people in Gauteng province, to be precise, 3.2 million people to provide food relief in the period of COVID to 3.2 million people in Gauteng province, working together with the private sector and NGOs. This is a critical intervention, especially given the severity and the economic impact of COVID-19. Our, our administration has also intervened in a number of areas to assist, including those who are homeless. We haven't forgotten the homeless people, and we are now bringing back programs to address the problem of homelessness in our province. With regard to education, this has been one of the most difficult years of education in our, in, our, in our country. We almost lost the 2020 academic year. There were voices that said we must, uh, we must just shut down in 2020. I am glad that many, many, many voices said we must continue, including government insisted that we must continue. And for that reason, we are proud of the teachers, the parents, 
and most importantly, the learners in grade 12 who have made us proud in this province. Gauteng province, under difficult conditions of, of COVID-19, we, we run the second biggest education system. We have maintained position two. It is not bad, Ms. Lissoufi. Well, we salute the free state. They are number one. We are number two. But in that number two, Houghton Province has got six out of the top ten districts in the country. And in that top ten, the top five districts are from Houghton. The beautiful story about the dis this district's performance is that there are many schools from the townships such as Attridgeville and Oliver and Hout Bosch, which are um, in the district that's the number one district in, in the country. There are many township schools. So what does this mean? That there are systems-wide improvements. Although the, the results of Houghton dropped from 87 to 83 percent, but there are sustained system improvements in these results. One of those sustained system improvements is that the throughput rate has improved from 77 to 79 percent, which means almost eight out of 10 learners who started grade one 12 years ago were able to write and complete their metric in 2019. That's a great achievement. Accounting for every learner is an important function of an education system. It's an extremely important function of the education system. Houghton Province has also contributed the largest number of bachelor passes. 49,679 bachelor passes come from Houghton Province. And amongst this is children from the township schools. We have contributed the largest number of distinctions. And amongst this is children from the township schools. So this is part of what we call a systems-wide improvement. It's not just improvement as a function of schools that, are fun that historically have done well. It's improvements in the whole system. So MEC Lissouf will tomorrow release detailed results of the class of 2020. But I want us to salute these young people and the educators who made us proud. They too were fearful. Some of them, this, our educators, uh, passed on. They, some, of, some of the young people, especially during this, the second wave, contracted coronavirus, but they became focused. They are a great inspiration to us. We continue to salute them, but we know in this province that we are not only focusing on grade 12s. Like I announced in 2019, that the Department of Education in our province is now evaluating every year the performance of all grades and publishing the results of all the grades. So MEC Lissouf will publish the results of all the grades uh, once, once uh, we are done with the grade 12 results. And this is very important because the parents need to know when they choose their schools. And we know there's a stampede when, when, when parents have to register their learners. And they get dissatisfied if they, they are allocated to a school which they think is not performing extremely well. But we have to be transparent with, with our citizens and parents need to have an opportunity to know why certain schools are doing well and which schools to take their children to. So, we are getting into a phase of a new academic year. There are adjustments to timetable we are going to do. There are significant adjustments to recover the lost time, but there's no turning back. We are not looking back. This year will also be another successful academic year. The COVID-19 pandemic has been quite severe. 19% of Houghton's population are now living on the side of pre precarity. They are living precarious life. 19% of the population of our province, almost 3 million people, do not have the certainty of getting food on the table every night they, they go to, to sleep. So we need a combination of measures. In addition to the food relief program that I referred to earlier on, we have to make sure that each of these three million people who are living precarious lives must be supported. How are we going to support them? 
We want to draw them into food production, food community food gardens. We want to draw those who are food insecure, those who don't have enough to eat, we want to draw them into producing food for themselves. Community gardens in our school, most of our schools have got huge spaces. Community gardens should be the order of the day where people can produce food for themselves and in addition be able to sell some of the food in, the, in our local markets. We also want to ensure that across the province we enhance our capacity to reach the homeless people. It is a very difficult issue. We dealt with it during this, the, this pandemic. We, want to, we, have, we have reached 1.3 million girl children during the year under review and provided them with di dignity packs. It is absolutely important that we intensify the fight against poverty and hunger. And it is absolutely important that we lift the potential of the agricultural sector in our province to be the source of employment. This is the only sector, not just nationally, but in Gauteng, the only sector that grew in the midst of COVID-19. And I believe, honorable members, that we in Gauteng sometimes undermine the role of agriculture. We in Gauteng think that, no, we are not an agricultural province, so food must be produced somewhere else, and then we just a, a market. There's huge agricultural potential. And for that reason, we have been supporting black farmers and agro-processors I made a commitment in 2019 that we are going to support, as a provincial government, we are going to support 50 black farmers, emerging black farmers. Let me tell you, we have supported 68. We have exceeded the target we set for 50. We, are, we have supported 68 black farmers who are now linked to the fresh produce market and retail, township retailers. So they are able to sell what they produce immediately onto the markets. We have also supported four agro-processors. Our target in five years is 20 agro-processors. These are emerging black agro-processors. So in the, just in the last 12 months in the midst of COVID, we have supported four agro-processors to help them be able to participate in the agro-processing agro sector. So it is possible to reach 350 black smallholder farmers and help them to have access to markets by 2024. We are focusing on agricultural nodes such as Hackworth in Mukhali City, uh, Devon in Lesedi, Bantubonke in Midval, and Sokulumi in the city of Tswan. I would like to use this opportunity to call on our municipalities to follow what Ekurulen is doing. Municipalities have a lot of agricultural land, almost like hoarded land. I want to call on them to release this land to those of, of our women and youth who want to take part in agriculture in this economic hub to have access to land. I'm calling on municipalities to do so following on the example of releasing land that Ekuruleni has set. Our province has to be a thriving province for everyone. We must leave no one behind. But we can thrive if crime is is taking over and undermining every little effort that we are making. I report to this legislature that we have now approved an integrated five-year Houghton policing plan, which was developed by the Department of Community Safety together with our law enforcement agencies. That plan has been approved. Ukai Mulao is now an established op anti-crime operation. And since March 2020, Ukai Mulao has conducted 2,900 operations, anti-crime operations across the province, bringing together law enforcement officers in a way they have never worked uh, together before, dealing with various sectors of uh, areas of crime, including gender-based violence, the illicit economy, the trio crimes, uh, counterfeit goods, uh, and so on. So this provincial government is, is absolutely committed to supporting, providing additional support to law enforcement agencies in our province so that they can take effective measures to reduce crime by 50%. That is our target. Reducing crime by 50%, especially in the crime hotspots, 
in our province is the target we set in growing Houghton together. So how are we supporting the law enforcement agencies? Just this past Saturday, we handed over 55 high-performance vehicles to the South African Police Service. This 55 is, is out of the 100 that we committed to buy for the police for the next three years. So we are over 50% of the three-year target. And I can tell you the morale in the, in the law enforcement services is very, very high. In fact, the police service, the last time they got new vehicles provided by the provincial government, it's a long time ago, uh, General Mawela is here. The, the mood is high. The police say with more resources, they will be able to, to, to get to the ground and respond to community, community calls more effectively in the fight against crime. In addition to the 55 vehicles, we said we will provide the police with 12 mobile stations. Now, mobile stations are important for areas that are... Gauteng is a province where, where there are new communities emerging in different places, and there are no police services in those areas. There are informal settlements that are difficult to, for people to access justice and, and, and law enforcement. So out of the 12 that we will provide in the next three years, at the moment, four are being assembled, and they will be handed over to the South African Police Service in the first, in the first quarter of this financial year. Four mobile stations will be handed over. As if that's not enough, we are tackling, we are coming face to face, tackling gender-based violence and, and femicide frontally and decisively. We have handed over to the FCS, the Specialized Police Unit dealing with gender-based violence, for 11 sedans. These are 11 new sedans whose focus will just be on gender-based violence to capacitate the response time of the police to deal with the abusers and the killers of women and children. We have also pro helped to build for them Five community service centers, and this is the infrastructure built by us using provincial government resources to respond, to enhance the capacity of the police to fight crime. So law enforcement agencies in our province are being given additional resources. It's not enough to just be oversight. It's not enough to say the role of the provincial government is oversight. We have to do beyond, go beyond oversight. We must be there. We must dirty our hands. We must be there with the police when they fight criminals. We must join them in operations at night, as MEC Mazvuko does. We must join them in, op in Ukaimulao operations uh, during the days. We must go there in Westbury when the gangsters are ter terrorizing our communities with the police. Go there. We can't just say it's oversight. Oversight is playing safe sitting here. We must be there on the ground with the police. We must be there in Mamelodi. You, you don't know. Wait until you see, Honorable Msima. Honorable members, the Minister of Police announced new crime statistics on Friday. We are very disturbed that the Gender-based violence and femicide is on the increase. This underscores the reality that women are under siege, and we must respond with all arsenals in our, in our hands. We must stop the killers of, and abusers of women and children on their track. There should be no place to hide for men who abuse and kill women and children in this beautiful province. We must find these perpetrators and bring them to book regardless of their place or, or influence in, in, in any organization or in, in our society. We are doing all these things in response to the president's plan about gender-based violence and femicide, having declared this as a pandemic. We have been working with various sectors of society in dealing with gender-based violence. MEC, Mazibuko has helped to recruit 620 GBV brigades. These are 
These are women and young people in the communities who are doing door-to-door -door work to help reach out to the victims of gender-based violence, advise them and on how they can reach access the police and open cases. And they have already reached 40,000 households. The gender-based brigades have already reached 40,000 households. So we are serious about this fight against gender-based violence. But I also want to appreciate the fact that statistics, the, the, the crimes, crime has decreased, in, particularly the trio crimes, have decreased in our province by 9.6% between October and December 2020. So what is increasing is gender-based violence. Other crimes that require effective police response, those have been decreasing. It's because gender-based violence requires more than the police. You need social mobilization. We need, because these crimes are happening in households by people who know each other, by people who must be protecting women. And we men are the perpetrators of this this, this crime against, against women and children. Even the educated ones, gender-based violence knows no education. Patriarchy knows no education. So, honorable members, it is important that we support Operation Okaimola. I want to take this opportunity to thank Business Against Crime, especially Tracker and Crime Watch for the work they are doing with our police services and other law enforcement agencies in crime prevention. We are not only focusing on that, we are also focusing on road safety. We, we have helped our traffic officers by providing additional 157 traffic officers to the current component of the traffic police. Our target is that by 2022, we will add 400 more traffic officers to the current team of traffic officers. I want to thank our, pol our Metro Police Departments. I cannot anymore stand before you and complain that there's no cooperation with the municipalities, not on any issue in Gauté. All the municipalities on crime, on economy, on social development, on COVID-19 are working together. So the Metro Police are doing a great job now. We have had problems before. I've complained to this house. But they are doing a great job working with the South African Police Service. But there is something this house must deal with. Alcohol is contributing to most of the crimes. This house must deal with this issue. And our government this year will review the regulations governing the sale of alcohol in Gauteng province. This legislature must help us deal with this. It's a sketch. This is a pandemic. There are shebins being opened next to, ch next to churches, ne next to ECD centers, next to schools. There are shebins being opened next to schools. Next. So alcohol... We cannot ban alcohol. No, we cannot ban it. But we must regulate, tighten the regulations that govern the sale of alcohol. So our municipalities are, must also focus on the issue of land, illegal land invasion. I've already said we are going to be providing additional resources to our teams, the interdepartmental team dealing with land invasion in Gauteng province. So honorable members, the sector that was also hardest hit by COVID-19 is the creative industries and the sporting fraternity. Almost at one point, at one moment, everything was shut down. The sporting, the sporting community, the creative industry, new ways had to be found for them to get to earn a living. The department, under the Department of Sports, Arts, Culture and Recreation in Gauteng, there's been an amazing new way of working. And I want to share with you those new interventions. The first thing is is that the Houghton Provincial Government set up a social relief fund for the sector. And that social relief fund 
has provided 2,145 artists and athletes with some relief of up, that re total amount is 12 million rands that has been accessed by the sector, the individuals in the sector so far. 12 million rands to assist those in the midst of COVID-19, the athletes and the artists who couldn't earn. It's a small amount because the number is huge. We have over 4,000. In fact, we had 4,900 people who wanted to access the relief. We could only provide relief to 2,100. Others couldn't qualify, but the department, working with the, the Department of Finance, will provide additional assistance up to, from the 12 million rents now, we think we'll be, we'll be able to reach 20 million rents that was set aside to assist the athletes and the artists in our province. As I say, the amount may be so small relative to what they would have earned on their own, but it is something. In addition, the, we were, the department was able to move commemorative days and many cultural activities to online activities. Over a short space of time, the department has converted what used to be big gatherings, big festivities to celebrate commemorative days are now taking place online. This has been very creative. This includes the introduction harnessing the influence of e-sport as a safe avenue for young people in our province. So the department just hosted How5 e-games, hashtag FIFA 21 tournament, which was attended by gaming professionals and amateurs. This issue of gaming is big. It's, big, it's a big economic activity that will be able to absorb young people and provide opportunities in both the gig economy and in the digital economy. Online services have also been provided with regard to libraries, including the installation of gaming devices in some of our community libraries. We are working together with local government and national government to intervene on the controversial issue of the Mandela Museum being put for liquidation. We are working together. We, we definitely cannot allow that. That's, that's, the, that's national heritage. We are working together with the liquidators to ensure that, uh, and the family, the Mandela family, to ensure that this national asset uh, is preserved. This heritage site is protected. And lastly, we worked with the PSL to make sure that the the 2019-2020 season is completed. We worked with the PSA. And I know that that completion cost some of us, but the 2019-2020 season was completed. It cost some of us, and some teams were able to graduate out of that. But we worked, we worked with the PSL to say that the PSL must complete that season in Gauti. It could have gone to KZN. It could have gone to the Northwest. But we worked with the PSL to say no. The, keeping it here does enhance economic activity in our province. So, honorable members, I want to com conclude by focusing on improving governance. Improving governance is extremely important in the light of the COVID corruption that we have seen that hit our provincial government and, and other de national departments and other provinces. We want to build a capable, ethical, and developmental state as a powerful weapon to create the Gauteng of our dreams. And COVID-19 has reaffirmed the need for effective government. It has reaffirmed the need these pandemics and these disasters, without government, you can't protect people from, the, from disasters. But you need effective government. You also need ethical government. You also need clean governance. So that these interventions must be for what they are meant to do, to help people and not be used for purposes that are evil purposes, for, rogue, for the rogue and the corrupt. And it is for this reason that we are going, I said we are going back, we are going, 
We are going, we are, we are going back to, to look at our plans in order to strengthen our capacity to respond to all the challenges and implement our plans. One clear thing is that the district development model has helped us in a, in, a, in a very big way, I've already reported about that. Intergovernmental relations have improved in a very big way. We are concerned that municipalities suffered severe revenue losses, 8.7 billion rands. Municipalities in Houghton lost 8.7 billion rands of revenue between April and July 2020. This had a, it has a huge impact on their financial viability including on their KPES projects and on some of their capacities to respond to service delivery demands of our people. Some of our municipalities, and there are not few, have difficulties in paying creditors such as ESCOM and Rainwater. And the provincial government has been working very closely in addressing some of this, intervening with ESCOM, intervening with Rainwater. But the provincial government has also been dealing with the issue of debt, including the money using the debt management committee, including the money owed by government to municipalities. This intervention is working. Because 1.6 billion rents has already been paid to municipalities out of this intervention, in the midst of the crisis that they are facing. And I want to say that amongst the municipalities facing real, real big challenges, it's Mfuleni local municipality. And Mfuleni local municipality reached a stage where it is, it is, it is not able to, to meet basic commitments, especially to state-owned enterprises in providing water and electricity. We have just received a report released by the South African Human Rights Commission, released on the 17th of February, and the findings are damning, and the provincial government can all we want to make a commitment to is that we are going to work with national government and the, municip the affected municipality and the district to, to address all the recommendations that have been put forward by the South African Human Rights Commission. Within 60 days, we are going to be working, we have already been working there with various national government departments. We ourselves have put money in Mfuleni for roads, the rehabilitation of roads for sorting out issues relating to waste management and waste removal. We have put money from the provincial government departments, gotten in there to assist in fixing some of the problems that are principally the responsibility of the municipality. It is absolutely important that we, we continue to work with the people of Mfuleni to address the challenges they are facing and turn around service delivery in that area. We remain committed to integrity and ethics in the city region. And I've, I've emphasized this point that the procurement irregularities and corruption allegation and actual corruption that took place during the pandemic has undermined the systems we have put in place and put into question their efficacy. And for that reason, we are reviewing all these systems to strengthen prevention, detection, investigation, and resolution of cases, any case of fraud and corruption in our system of government. The implementation of the open tender system was very groundbreaking when it was introduced. It helps us over a period of five years to deal with, to enhance uh, clean governance in our province. The partnership we have with the Special Investigation Unit over four years to deal with various issues, including the issues of medical legal claims, has also helped. But we face new challenges. This act of corruption just shows that the criminal and rogue elements are always hanging around, waiting to pounce at the greatest opportunity. And we are going to crack the whip and strengthen all these measures and one of the important things we are going to do is to shine a spotlight on every department and agency that's not complying with clean governance. I am glad that the Public Service Commissioner Mike Siloane is here, who always shines a spotlight on maladministration, irregularities in government, including acts 
of corruption where they are brought to the attention of the Public Service Commission. We will work with all the various institutions, the Public Service Commission, the Special Investigation Unit, and the Office of the Public Protector in addressing all these issues because they undermine the tremendous capacity and potential of our province to be at the, at the driving seat of all economic and social development in our country. Members of the Executive Council have already complied with the need to submit themselves to lifestyle audits. They have complied, and this matter is now in the hands of the State Security Agency that's dealing with lifestyle audits, not only for Gauteng, but for the whole, for, for the whole of South Africa. And several provinces have also called for this, and the President has also called for this. I want to report that the vetting of senior officials of government is progressing very well. 65% of senior managers and 70% of supply chain managers in Gauteng have already been vetted. In the midst of COVID-19, as these corruption scandals were coming to the fore, the momentum to vet all the, not just the ones that are the HODs, but including people, all people in supply chain, this momentum has gathered pace very, very, very strongly. The, I want to report that there's been some regression in some of our departments on the issue of clean audits. And we are paying attention to each of these departments where there's some regression. Because we want to ensure that our province continue to improve as we have done in the past five years where we improved from 54 to 65 percent clean audits. We want to continue to improve on the track record of the fifth administration. I am glad though to report that the office of the premier and the provincial treasury has been leading by ex example. Because if your treasury department cannot achieve clean audits, the department that oversees our money, public, the public resources, you are in danger. And if a, the, prim, the office of the premier cannot achieve clean audit, you are in great danger. So these two departments over eight years, uh, over eight years, from 2013 to this, 20, this last financial year, for eight consecutive years, these two departments have achieved clean audits without any doubt about it. And this is the track record that must be maintained and all the departments must follow. I am glad to say that one of the, one of the things we pride ourselves of is that we enter the Public, Public Service Bhaktupili Excellence Awards run by the Public Service and Administration Department every year to identify the best functioning departments in provinces and offices in service delivery and in response. Now, I'm proud to report that our DG, Ms. Pini Levaleni, received the best provincial DG award in silver, the best provincial DG in silver award. You, you, would be, you, you would be interested to know she was competing with who? Western Cape and Northern Cape. The three, the, three, the three provinces which were competing for the awards. So DG, well done. Well done, DG. And I expect nothing less from you. you you've got, because these things are just basic things we must do. We must achieve much more. It is absolutely important that we do so. So, honorable members, it is important that we focus all the greater efforts of our provincial government on addressing major problems that have surfaced during COVID-19, which expose the weaknesses of our provincial government, the governance weaknesses, capacity issues, and the, the creep the, from time to time that fraud and corruption creeps in to undermine our capacity to to deliver to the people of our province. We will continue to work with these various agencies. We are, we are also going to continue to strengthen Teresano. One thing that has been done now is to roll out ward-based teams 
war rooms to communities to address different issues. We started with COVID-19, but these ward-based community teams, are war rooms, are also going to help us to deal with various disasters and other issues of service delivery in our province. We are also going to use a lot of uh, e-platforms in dealing with these issues. So, Madam Speaker, allow me to conclude by reminding the people of our province that we live in a historical epoch which has changed the common sense of our time. At both micro and macro social level, we have had to change the way we live our lives in order to contain the spread of COVID-19 and the deadly coronavirus. We are equally conscious of the fact that in the eyes of our people, the residents of Gauteng, Clean governance means an ethical state geared to meet their social needs, as well as meet their economic and political needs by empowering citizens to shape their own destiny. So these expectations of citizens are legitimate and they must be met. And we must confront and tackle decisively unscrupulous rogue elements and thieves who use every occasion like a disaster to want to loot the resources meant to improve the quality of life of our people. Who use emergency conditions to want to loot the public purse. And the truth is trust has been eroded. Trust in our government, in this ANC-led government in Gauteng, has been eroded. And trust has been undermined when we have been working so hard to build that trust. And we are not going to take this lying down. Trust will only be restored when all those responsible are thrown behind bars. Those responsible for acts of corruption are thrown behind bars. Those who have betrayed the popular trust of the masses. And this trust stands from amongst the poor and the urban precariat. People who live their lives not knowing where bread is going to, where food is going to come from every day. They, they are the fundamental motive forces of, of supporting this government. And, but we have betrayed their trust through these acts of this irreg irregular practices and acts of corruption. I wish to reassure the people of our province that we will fight back to win their trust. It is not easy when trust is lost. We will fight back through our own actions, prove and show that we are tackling, we are rolling back corruption out of this provincial government. We are definitely unfazed. As we deal with the four priorities I have outlined, we are unfazed. We remain unshaken. As we face this storm of COVID-19, we know we will be able to deal with other storms that will come along our, our way. But Gauteng will remain the pioneer, and the people of our province will remain the makers of their own history. We have learned from history and our, the history of our struggle that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards, as pointed out by Soren Gigerhardt. This province will bounce back and move forward in a way that leaves no one behind. I want to take this opportunity to thank you all on behalf of the entire team of our Provincial Executive Council and the whole leadership of our Houghton City region, which include our mayors. God bless Africa. And God bless Houghton. And God bless South Africa. Thank you. At this stage, I will request that only members of the provincial legislature 
who are connecting virtually should switch on their videos. Uh, the ICT team needs to... No, it's not about you, Honorable Msimang. Switch on your videos as there's going to be an electronic photo shoot. Uh, but not, if you are not a member of the provincial legislature, please switch off. Uh, we only need members of the provincial legislature. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Premier, for your address. And in terms of Rule 16, we want you to forward the, the, your address to the table for placing in the other paper. I know that is going to be a bit difficult, but an e-submission will be, will be um, um, appreciated. But thank you very much. Thank you very much to all uh, citizens who were able to connect. Thank you to all uh, our guests who were able to come here. I know that we had to limit the number. But thank you very much to all, including all our members who are, who are here. Thank you. Our next, next sitting will be on Thursday, the 25th of February 2021, at 10 hours sharp. The sitting is now adjourned. Thank you.